During these days of intensive work, my old acquaintance General von Rabenau brought to me Dr. Goedela, who strongly wanted to talk to me about something. Mr. Doctor. Goedela began to tell me that Hitler was incapable of performing the duties of Reich Chancellor and Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, and therefore it was necessary to limit the Führer in his powers. He detailed to me his draft programme of government and his reforms, which showed great idealism. They provided for social equalisation, which was certainly desirable, though Dr. Goedela's doctrinaire methods would make it difficult to settle the question. In case the plans were successful, however, Dr. Goadella could not guarantee foreign support. Apparently, he had once before tried to establish contact with abroad, but his attempt had been met very coldly. The demand of our opponents for unconditional surrender would have remained in force also if Dr. Goadella had been successful. I asked Dr. Goadella how he imagined the limitation of Hitler's powers. He replied that nominally he should be left head of the Reich, but interned in Obersalzburg or some other safe place. To my question as to the method of eliminating the leading national socialists, without which it was impossible to count on the successful execution of his plan, he replied that it was a matter for the Wehrmacht. But Dr. Goedela had not yet succeeded in swaying any of the army commanders at the front to his side. He therefore asked me, when visiting the active army, to put forward his demands, and then inform him which of the generals agreed to follow him. When I asked him who was leading the effort, he named Colonel General Beck. I was greatly surprised to learn that a man like Beck, whose indecisive character I was well aware of, had been drawn into such an undertaking. Beck was a most unsuitable person to carry out a coup d'état, for he could never come to a definite decision, and had no authority in the army moreover, he was unknown to the army. Beck was a philosopher, but not a revolutionary. The shortcomings and weaknesses of the National Socialist system and Hitler's mistakes appeared at that time quite clearly. I also saw all these defects, therefore, it was necessary to strive to eliminate them. However, in the perilous situation in which the Reich found itself as a result of the disaster at Stalingrad, and in the conditions in which the Soviet Union also demanded unconditional surrender, it was necessary to choose a path that would not lead the Reich and the nation to disaster. This was the main difficulty, and it placed a great responsibility on those who in their hearts still hoped for the possibility of saving the Reich. I therefore concluded to abandon Dr. Goadella's intentions as impracticable and detrimental to the general interest. Like the rest of the army, I felt bound by my oath. I therefore asked Dr. Goadella to recant his intention. Nevertheless, Dr. Goadella asked me, in spite of my doubts, to gather the necessary information for him. I agreed to comply with this impertinent demand with the intention of proving to Dr. Goadella that not only I, but also other generals thought the same way I hoped to make this undoubtedly idealistic man turn from his dangerous path. In April I saw Dr. Goedela once more, and was able to assure him that I had not met a single general who was inclined to agree with his plans. The persons I interviewed, citing their oaths and the grave situation at the front, refused to take any part in Dr. Goedela's designs. I again asked him to renounce his intentions. Dr. Goadella, who, however, in conversations refused quite clearly from the idea of an assassination attempt, finally asked me to keep silent about our conversation, and I kept this promise. In 1947, I learned from the book officers against Hitler. By the prosecutor Fabian von Schlebrendorf that either Dr. Goadella or General von Rabenau had not kept their promise to keep silent. The reports of the said book about me were not true. Since April 1943, I have not spoken to Dr. Goadella again, nor have I heard anything about his intentions. However, let us return to my service activities. On March 29th, I flew to Zaporozhye to Army Group South to visit Field Marshal von Manstein. He had just achieved a major success thanks to the correct operational use of tank formations again captured Kharkov. 
The topic of my conversation with Manstein was the experience gained in these actions, especially the experience of using battalions, which were armed with tanks Tiger in the Panzer Division Greater Germany and the SS Panzer Division Adolf Hitler. At headquarters I met my old friend Goff, commander of the 4th Tank Army, who also shared his combat experience with me. It became clear to me again how unfortunate the fact that Hitler was unable to tolerate close to him such a capable military personality like Manstein. Both were two different natures on the one hand willful Hitler with his military dilettantism and indomitable imagination, on the other Manstein with his outstanding military ability and with the hardening received in the German general staff, sober and cold-blooded judgment. Our best operational mind. Later, when I was appointed chief of the general staff of the army, I repeatedly suggested to Hitler to appoint Manstein instead of Keitel as chief of the general staff of the armed forces, but each time in vain. Of course, Keitel was convenient for Hitler. He tried to read Hitler's thoughts through his eyes and fulfill them before the latter expressed them. Manstein was inconvenient. He had his own opinion, which he openly expressed. In the end, Hitler said to my suggestions, Manstein may be the best mind born of the general staff, but he can only operate fresh, good divisions, not the ruins which today we only have. Since I can't give him a single fresh, capable of action compound today, his appointment is meaningless. He simply did not want this appointment and masked himself with such evasive explanations. I then flew to Poltava to the army group Kempfef, and from there on March 30th to the Division Great Germany, the SS Panzer Division Adolf Hitler, and on March 31st to the Corps of General von Nobelsdorf. Everywhere I tried to get first of all a clear picture of the combat experience of the Tigers in order to know about their tactical and technical capabilities, and to draw conclusions for the future organisation of tank formations armed with Tigers. I ended my first visit to the front as Inspector General on April 1st with a farewell visit to Manstein in Zaporozhye. The results of this first trip to the fronts were reflected in my conversation with Speer about increasing the production of tanks Tiger and Panther and in a report to Hitler on April 11th in Berchtesgaden, which I had to see then for the first time. The Führer's Villa Berghof is notable for the fact that in that part of it, in which we were able to visit, we did not see interconnected rooms. Only the large reception hall looked majestic, with a wonderful view of the mountains from the window. There were several expensive carpets and paintings. Among the latter a magnificent Führbach in front of the fireplace there was a special elevation on which Hitler spent the night hours after the so-called evening meal in a narrow circle of his entourage, military and party adjutants and secretaries. I never belonged to this circle. On the same day I visited Himmler, with whom I discussed issues related to the coordination of the organisation of tank formations of the SS troops and tank formations of the ground forces. In my endeavours I achieved only partial success. Himmler especially did not want to agree with my desire to abandon the new formations. True, Hitler recognised during my report on March 9th that the new formations of weaknesses but in the matter of the SS troops Hitler together with Himmler behind the back of the soldiers quietly nurtured the idea of creating independent of the ground forces, yet to the command of which the Führer never had full confidence, a private army a kind of Praetorian guard. From it he expected the greatest loyalty and readiness for any action also in case the ground forces, constrained in their actions by the old Prussian-German traditions, refused to follow Hitler. This dual policy of Hitler and Himmler put the SS troops in an extremely unpleasant position after the war, as they began to be blamed for the blunders of the other SS units, and especially the police security forces. Already during the war, the incessant favouring of the SS troops in the allocation of their reserves and the determination of their strength, armament and equipment caused justifiable resentment in the less fortunate formations of the land forces. And if the sense of camaraderie at the front stood above such injustice, it was only because of the dedication of the German soldier, who remained the same no matter what colour uniform he wore. I used the day of April 12th to pay a visit to Colonel General Jeschkoinek, Chief of the Air Force General Staff. I met a tired man in a completely depressed mood. 
We had not even had a formal conversation about things that had a direct bearing on both branches of the military, both armoured and air forces. All the more, we failed to achieve any rapprochement. Shortly after our meeting, Jeschonik could not bear Hitler's and Goering's accusations of the inactivity of the air force and committed suicide. He followed the example of his comrade Udate, who took the same desperate step in November 1941 because he could find no other way out of his situation, realizing what was necessary for the conduct of the war, and seeing the inability and inaction of Goering. My visit to the commander-in-chief of the Air Force never took place because of that gentleman's strenuous outside activities. Returning to Berlin, I had a lengthy conversation with Schmunt on April 13th. In view of the hopeless situation in Africa, I sought to induce him to help me to take out of there by air tank crews, which had become superfluous in the present conditions, and most importantly, well trained as a result of long years of training of commanders and their technical assistance. Probably I spoke unconvincingly with Schmunt, or he himself vaguely reported to Hitler about my desire, because when I at the subsequent report to the Fuhrer himself outlined his request, I failed. The interests of preserving prestige, as is often the case, triumphed over reason. The airplanes, flying in large numbers empty to Italy, could capture these valuable people and provide us with the formation and replenishment of units both in the rear and at the front. I reported on this again in Obersalzburg on April 29th on the same day. Together with Boulet, Keitel and Speer were resolved issues of organisation and armament, more and more units continued to be sent to Africa and burned there. Tank units armed with the latest Tigers were also sent there. No objections were paid attention to the same was done later in the defence of Sicily. When I wanted to return the tanks tighter on the mainland, Goring intervened, can not Tigers take a pole and jump across the Strait of Messina? You must agree with this, Colonel General Guderian. I replied, if you really dominate the air over the Strait of Messina, the Tigers can return in the same way they got to Sicily to this, the air specialist replied with silence. The Tigers remained in Sicily. April 30th from Birchdiesgade and I flew from Birchdiesgaden to Paris to pay the first visit to the commander-in-chief of the troops in the Westfield Marshal von Rundstedt, to inspect the tank formations in the West, and to check the defensive capabilities of the Atlantic Rampart in anti-tank. In the 81st Army Corps, but my old colleague in France, General Kuntzen, who was in Rouen, I received information about the defence of the coast, then visited the 100th Tank Regiment in Iveto, armed with French trophy tanks. Here I was caught by a telegram from Hitler, who summoned me to a meeting in Munich. I arrived in Munich on May 2nd. The first meeting was held on May 3rd, the second on May 4th in the presence of my Chief of Staff to mail, summoned from Berlin with new materials. At these meetings, which were attended by the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces, representatives of the General Staff of the Armed Forces, the Chief of the General Staff of the Army with his responsible officers, the commanders of army groups, South von Manstein and Centre von Kluge, commander of the Ninth Army Model, Minister Speer and others, there was a very serious question whether army groups south and centre of the Eastern Front in the near future should launch an offensive. This question was discussed at the suggestion of the Chief of the General Staff, General Zeitzler, who wanted to use a double flank coverage to destroy a number of Russian divisions near Kursk, whose positions formed an arc extended to the west. By this blow, he wanted to weaken the offensive impulse of the Russian army to such an extent as to create favourable conditions for the German High Command to further conduct the war in the east. This issue was hotly discussed back in April. But then, immediately after the disaster at Stalingrad and the subsequent defeat in the southern section of the Eastern Front, hardly anyone could think of major offensive actions. But now the Chief of General Staff wanted to use the new tanks Tiger and Panther, which were supposed, in his opinion, to bring decisive success, again seize the initiative in their hands. The meeting was opened by Hitler. In his 45-minute speech, he thoroughly outlined the situation on the Eastern Front and put on the discussion of the proposals of the Chief of the General Staff and the objections of General Model. Model, having detailed intelligence data, 
especially aerial photographs, proved that just on these parts of the front, in which both groups of armies want to take the offensive, the Russians have prepared a deeply echeloned, carefully organized defense. By that time the Russians had already withdrawn the main forces of their motor-mechanized troops from the forward positions and in turn on the likely directions of our breakthrough, which we planned to carry out according to our offensive scheme, unusually strengthened their artillery and anti-tank means. Model concluded correctly from this that the enemy was counting on our offensive therefore to succeed, it is necessary to follow other tactics, or better yet, if we abandon the offensive altogether. From the expressions in which Hitler presented the opinion of Model, it was unmistakable to determine that it had a strong influence on him, and that he hesitates to appoint an offensive according to the Zeitzler plan. Hitler asked Field Marshal von Manstein to be the first to speak on Zeitzler's proposal. Manstein was out of luck, as was often the case during his face-to-face -face conversations with Hitler. He said that the offensive would be a success if it could be launched in April, now he doubts the success. To carry out the offensive he must be given two more combat-ready infantry divisions. Hitler replied that he does not have such two divisions, and that Manstein must make do with the forces that he has then he repeated his question again, but did not receive a clear answer. Hitler then turned to Field Marshal von Kluge, who spoke directly in favour of Zeitzler's proposal. I asked for the floor and stated that the offensive is aimless are just pulled up on the Eastern Front fresh forces in the offensive according to the plan of the Chief of General Staff will be defeated again, for we are certain to suffer heavy losses in tanks. We are not in a position to replenish the Eastern Front once again with fresh forces during 1943 moreover, we must now also think about supplying the Western Front with the latest tanks in order to confidently meet with mobile reserves expected in 1944 landing of the Western powers. In addition, I pointed out that the Tank Panther, on which the Chief of General Staff of the Army laid great hopes, found many shortcomings inherent in each new design, and that it is difficult to hope for their elimination before the offensive. Beer supported my arguments as far as armament was concerned. But we were the only two participants in this meeting, who to Zeitzler's proposal clearly answered no. Hitler, who was not yet fully convinced by the supporters of the offensive, never came to a final decision on this day. In addition to the meeting, which was of a military nature, I also had a personal conversation in Munich that day for the first time since the events of December 1941. I met Field Marshal von Kluge again. His unfriendly greeting reopened my old wounds. I replied very coldly. After the meeting, Mr. Von Kluge invited me into the next room and asked me the reasons for my unfriendliness. I had to answer what lay in my heart against him. At the same time, I emphasized that after all the circumstances of the events had been clarified, he should give an explanation of his behavior in December 1941. We parted without finding out anything. Some time later, Schmund visited me in Berlin and gave me a letter from Field Marshal von Kluge to Hitler to read. Von Kluge challenged me in this letter to a duel. Von Kluge knew quite clearly that duels were forbidden, and that Hitler would not tolerate his generals doing it during the war. Nevertheless, he chose Hitler to mediate. Schmund stated to me on Hitler's behalf that the Führer did not wish this duel, he wanted this quarrel to be settled by suitable means. I granted Hitler's wish by writing a letter to Field Marshal von Kluge, in which I expressed regret that my behaviour in Munich I offended him, noting that all this was a reaction to the heavy offence that he inflicted on me in 1941, and that therefore I could not do otherwise. In the field of tank construction in April, it was decided to continue production of the TIV tank according to my orders until the serial production of the Panther tank was fully secured. The monthly output of tanks was to reach 1,955 units. It was ordered to strengthen active air defence in the most important centres of the tank industry castle, Friedrichsgafen and Schweinfurt. In my report of May 4th in Munich, I proposed to create replacement centres for the production of tanks, but against this proposal was opposed. The first deputy Speer saw who argued that the enemy's aviation concentrates its efforts only on aircraft factories, 
and did not want to believe that after the destruction of aircraft factories on the turn of common sense tank factories. On May 10th, Hitler was in Berlin, and I was summoned to a meeting at the Imperial Chancellery on the production of the Panther tank, as the industry was unable to produce them in the original time frame. To eliminate this backlog, an increased production figure was set instead of 250 tanks by May 31st, 324 tanks were to be produced. After the end of the meeting, I took Hitler under my arm and asked permission to tell him frankly a few words. He agreed, and I began to persuade him to abandon the offensive on the Eastern Front, as he should be able to see what difficulties we must fight now. At present, it is not worthwhile to undertake major operations. The defense in the West will suffer greatly from this. I ended with the question, why do you want to launch an offensive in the East just this year? Here Keitel intervened in the conversation we must launch an offensive for political reasons. I objected, do you think people know where Kursk is? The world does not care whether Kursk is in our hands or not. I repeat my question, why do you want to launch an offensive in the East this very year? Hitler answered literally the following, you are quite right. At the thought of this offensive, I get a stomach ache, I replied. You have the right reaction to the situation. Give up this venture, Hitler assured that in solving this issue, he in no way feels bound. This was the end of the conversation. In addition to Field Marshal Keitel, who is now no longer alive, witnesses to this conversation were my chief of staff to mail and mister, saw from the Ministry of Arms and Munitions. A day later I left by train for Lotzen, where my headquarters was temporarily located. There I toured the local barracks. On May 13th, I had a conversation with Speer, and in the afternoon was on the report to Hitler. May 1st, Hitler was shown a wooden model of the mouse at tank Professor Porsche and the firm Krupp, on which it was intended to install a 150mm gun. The total weight of the tank was to reach 175 tons. It was necessary to count on the fact that he actually, after the design changes, according to Hitler's instructions, will weigh 200 tons. The model did not have a single machine gun for close combat. For this reason alone I had to reject it. The design had the same flaw that made Porsche's Ferdinand unsuitable for close combat. And after all, the tank in the end inevitably has to conduct close combat because it operates in conjunction with infantry. A heated debate began, as everyone present, except me, found the mouse magnificent. It promised to be exactly gigantic. In addition to the mouse, a very successful wooden model of the Womag self-propelled gun, based on the TIV tank, was shown. Its height was only 170 cm i.e. It was on the verge of almost possible height. Then was shown a self-propelled gun armed with a heavy infantry gun and a model tank with a 37mm twin anti-aircraft gun. After the model demonstrations were completed, I flew to Berlin. On May 24th and 25, I inspected the 654th Tank Battalion stationed at Bruck on the Leith. The battalion was armed with the already mentioned Porsche Tiger tanks. I then visited the Nibelungenwerk factory in Linz, which produced Panther tanks and anti-tank guns. May 26th from Linz I flew to Paris to inspect the School of Tank Battalion Commanders. On May 27th I visited the 216th Tank Battalion in Amiens. On May 28th I visited the Company Commanders course in Versailles and the commanders of the 14th and 16th Tank Divisions in Nantes. Finally on May 29th I visited the fortress of Saint-Nazaire and familiarised myself with the defences of the Atlantic Rampart. The impression I got on seeing them was even worse than I had expected, having been being critical of the Rampart's loud propaganda. I then flew to Berlin on May 30th, to Innsbruck on May 31st to talk with Speer, and on June 1st to Grafanwer to inspect the 51st and 52nd tank battalions. The same day I returned to Berlin. Meanwhile, the High Command of the Armed Forces came to a strange decision to send the 1st Panzer Division to the Peloponnese in case of a British landing in Greece. This division had just been replenished, and it included the 1st Tank Battalion, armed with newly released Panther tanks. It was our strongest reserve. And now we had to put her on the line. 
My indignation-filled protest was drowned in the ridiculous arguments of Ketel, who argued that the mountain division, which I recommended as the most suitable for action in Greece, would be impossible to supply with large quantities of forage, because it would require large vehicles. I was in no position to reverse this decision, but began at my own risk to prevent the shipment of panther tanks to Greece. Soon a tank officer who was sent to Greece to conduct aerial reconnaissance informed me that the Greek narrow mountain roads and bridges are not suitable for tanks panther, with their wide track. Thanks to this argument, I was able to retroactively obtain permission from Hitler for my actions. Soon we felt how much we needed the 1st Panzer Division in Russia. June 15th I again dealt with our ward children Panther, which turned out to be out of order side gears and revealed deficiencies in optics. The next day I expressed my doubts to Hitler about the advisability of using tanks Panther. On the Eastern Front, as they were not yet fully prepared for their use in combat, in Munich at the Hotel Fieri Arisseiten I met with Field Marshal Rommel and had a conversation with him about the experience of using tanks in the African theatre of operations. In the evening I flew to Berlin, inspected on June 18th in Utebog artillery armament, and on the same day flew to Berchtesgaden to report to Hitler. A short stop in Grafenfan once again gave me the opportunity to familiarise myself in the 51st and 52nd tank battalions with the negative aspects of the tank Panther, and then report to Hitler. In addition to the technical shortcomings of the still imperfect Panther, there were also shortcomings in the crews of the vehicles, in particular the drivers, still poorly trained in the new technique, and did not have sufficient frontline experience. Unfortunately, all these considerations did not deter neither Hitler nor the Chief of General Staff of the Army from the ill-fated offensive called Citadel, which was launched in the East. The African Theatre of Operations finally ceased to exist on May 12th with the surrender of Tunisia. On July 10th, the Allies landed in Sicily. On July 25th, Mussolini was deposed and arrested. Marshal Badaglia was entrusted with the formation of a government the secession of Italy became a matter of immediate concern. While the events in the South more and more brought the war closer to the borders of Germany, Hitler launched an unacceptable by design and conduct of the offensive in the East. In the South, ten panzer divisions, one motorized division, and seven infantry divisions were advancing from the Belgorod area in the North. Seven panzer divisions, two motorized divisions, and nine infantry divisions were advancing from the area west of Oral. All that the ground forces were able to concentrate to increase their offensive strength was used in this offensive, about which Hitler himself correctly said in Munich, that it has no right to fail, as even a retreat back to the original positions would be a defeat. How Hitler decided to attack, it is still unclear. In all likelihood, the decisive was the pressure of the Chief of General Staff of the Army. The offensive began on July 5th manoeuvre, long known to the Russians on numerous previous operations, and therefore beforehand they figured out. Hitler abandoned both of his counter-proposals in favour of the Plan Zeitzler, who wanted to destroy the Russian positions put forward in the form of an arc double coverage in the general direction of the city of Tim, and thereby seize the initiative on the eastern on the eastern front again in their hands. From July 10th to July 15th, I visited both advancing fronts, first the southern, then the northern, and clarified on the spot in conversations with tank commanders the course of events, the shortcomings of our tactical methods in offensive combat, and the negative aspects of our equipment. My fears about insufficient preparation of Panther tanks for combat operations at the front were confirmed. 90 Tanks Tiger Porsche, used in the Army of Model, also showed that they do not meet the requirements of close combat. These tanks, as it turned out, were not even sufficiently supplied with ammunition. The situation was exacerbated by the fact that they had no machine guns and therefore, when they broke into the defensive positions of the enemy, literally had to shoot guns at sparrows. They were unable to destroy or suppress enemy infantry fire points and machine gun nests to allow their infantry to advance. They marched out to the Russian artillery positions alone, without infantry. Despite exceptional bravery and unheard of sacrifices, 
the infantry of Widling's division was unable to capitalize on the success of the tanks. Having advanced about 10 kilometers, Model's troops were stopped. True, there was more success in the south, but it was not enough to block the Russian arc or to lower the resistance. On July 15th began the Russian counteroffensive on Oral, whose defences were weakened in order to free up forces for the offensive. On August 4th the city had to be left. On the same day Belgorod fell. Until that day the units that were in the area of the Zusha River, Oka River northeast of Oral, stubbornly repelled all enemy attacks. This was the very area that I had chosen back in December 1941 for the concentration of my second tank army. Because of this area and I had a conflict with Hitler, which was then used by Field Marshal von Kluge to remove me from office. As a result of the failure of the offensive citadel we suffered a decisive defeat. Armoured troops, replenished with such great difficulty, due to heavy losses in men and equipment for a long time were put out of action their timely restoration for the conduct of defensive operations on the Eastern Front, as well as for the organization of defense in the West in case of landing, which the Allies threatened to land the following spring, was called into question. Needless to say, the Russians rushed to capitalize on their success, and there were no more quiet days on the Eastern Front. The initiative was completely taken over by the enemy. After July 15th, I went to France to inspect tank formations. At the end of July, I visited the formations that had in service tanks Tiger in the training camp Sen near Paderborn. From the camp, I was summoned by Hitler's telegram to East Prussia. During my first report, I fell ill. Dysentery, which I had contracted in Russia and to which I had not even paid attention at first, made me go to bed. Having recovered a little, I flew to Berlin to be finally cured. In the first days of August, I underwent an operation that left me bedridden for the rest of the month. Shortly before the operation, I was visited by General von Tresco, former chief of operations at Field Marshal von Kluge. He told me that he had come on behalf of the Field Marshal, who could reconcile with me if I made the first step towards reconciliation. He wanted to stand with me against Hitler in order to achieve a limitation of the powers of the latter as supreme commander of the armed forces. I could not agree to this proposal, because I knew very well the unstable character of Field Marshal von Kluge. Therefore, I was forced to reject the request of General Treskov. My health recovered slowly. Intensified bombardment of Berlin by enemy aircraft in August 1943 disturbed the peace necessary for recovery. Together with my wife, we decided to accept the offer of Speer, who found a villa in a beautiful mountainous area for me at a resort of the imperial government in Upper Austria. As soon as we arrived there on September 3rd, we received news on September 4th that our Berlin apartment had been almost completely destroyed by a direct bomb hit. The remains of our possessions were placed in the basement of one of the barracks in Wunsdorf. It was a heavy blow. We had already begun to think about moving permanently to Upper Austria when we received a telegram that the Reich would grant us the subsidy established by a regulation adopted in the fall of 1942. It was Schmunt, who had learned of the destruction of our house, who made sure that we received such a reimbursement. There was nothing else to do but to be satisfied with this good offer. In October 1943, my wife moved to Diepenhof, where she lived until the Russians arrived there, i.e., until January 20th, 1945. Meanwhile, in my absence, an attempt was made to replace the production of TIV tanks with the production of self-propelled guns. Todd's organization, which was building the Atlantic Rampart and other fortifications, made a proposal to install Panther tank turrets on long-term firing points. This, with our insignificant production of tanks, this was undoubtedly a heavy blow to the command of armored forces. Such a proposal showed an absolute lack of understanding of the role of tanks. Immediately after returning from the resort, I again set about resolving the issue of production of a tank with an anti-aircraft gun. Hitler approved the design of 37mm twin mount. But the 20mm twin mount on the chassis of the TIV tank was rejected by him. And the production of this important defensive weapon had to be postponed again. 
On October 20, 1943, Hitler was shown in the training camp Aris wooden model of the tank Tiger II. An extremely successful new model of the tank Tiger, later dubbed by our enemy's Royal Tiger, self-propelled gun firm Vomag, the Tiger self-propelled gun model with a 128mm gun, a 380mm mortar on the chassis of the Tiger tank, a TIII tank with devices for moving along the railway track, as well as light and heavy armoured railroad cars of various types. After the model demonstrations were completed, I flew to Berlin. On May 24th and 25, I inspected the 654th Tank Battalion stationed at Bruck on the Leith. The battalion was armed with the already mentioned Porsche Tiger tanks. I then visited the Nibelungenwerk factory in Linz, which produced Panther tanks and anti-tank guns. May 26th from Linz I flew to Paris to inspect the School of Tank Battalion Commanders. On May 27th I visited the 216th Tank Battalion in Amiens. On May 28th I visited the Company Commanders Course in Versailles and the Commanders of the 14th and 16th Tank Divisions in Nantes. Finally, on May 29th, I visited the fortress of St. Nazaire and familiarized myself with the defences of the Atlantic Rampart. The impression I got on seeing them was even worse than I had expected, having been, been critical of the Rampart's loud propaganda. I then flew to Berlin on May 30th, to Innsbruck on May 31st to talk with Speer, and on June 1st to Grafanwer to inspect the 51st and 52nd tank battalions. The same day I returned to Berlin. Meanwhile, the high command of the armed forces came to a strange decision to send the 1st Panzer Division to the Peloponnese in case of a British landing in Greece. This division had just been replenished, and it included the 1st Tank Battalion, armed with newly released Panther tanks. It was our strongest reserve. And now we had to put her on the line. My indignation-filled protest was drowned in the ridiculous arguments of Keitel who argued that the mountain division, which I recommended as the most suitable for action in Greece, would be impossible to supply with large quantities of forage, because it would require large vehicles. I was in no position to reverse this decision, but began at my own risk to prevent the shipment of Panther tanks to Greece. Soon a tank officer who was sent to Greece to conduct aerial reconnaissance informed me that the Greek narrow mountain roads and bridges are not suitable for tanks Panther with their wide track. Thanks to this argument, I was able to retroactively obtain permission from Hitler for my actions. Soon we felt how much we needed the 1st Panzer Division in Russia. June 15th I again dealt with our ward children Panther, which turned out to be out of order side gears and revealed deficiencies in optics. The next day I expressed my doubts to Hitler about the advisability of using tanks Panther. On the Eastern Front, as they were not yet fully prepared for their use in combat. In Munich at the Hotel Fieriarisseiten I met with Field Marshal Rommel and had a conversation with him about the experience of using tanks in the African theatre of operations. In the evening I flew to Berlin, inspected on June 18th in Utebog artillery armament, and on the same day flew to Berchtesgaden to report to Hitler. A short stop in Gruffen Fan once again gave me the opportunity to familiarise myself in the 51st and 52nd tank battalions with the negative aspects of the tank Panther, and then report to Hitler. In addition to the technical shortcomings of the still imperfect Panther, there were also shortcomings in the crews of the vehicles, in particular the drivers, still poorly trained in the new technique, and did not have sufficient frontline experience. Unfortunately, all these considerations did not deter neither Hitler nor the chief of general staff of the army from the ill-fated offensive called Citadel, which was launched in the east. The African theatre of operations finally ceased to exist on May 12th with the surrender of Tunisia. On July 10th, the Allies landed in Sicily. On July 25th, Mussolini was deposed and arrested. Marshal Badaglia was entrusted with the formation of a government the secession of Italy became a matter of immediate concern. While the events in the South more and more brought the war closer to the borders of Germany, Hitler launched an unacceptable by design and conduct of the offensive in the East. In the South, ten panzer divisions, one motorised division, 
and seven infantry divisions were advancing from the Belgorod area in the north, seven panzer divisions, two motorized divisions, and nine infantry divisions were advancing from the area west of Oral. All that the ground forces were able to concentrate to increase their offensive strength was used in this offensive, about which Hitler himself correctly said in Munich, that it has no right to fail, as even a retreat back to the original positions would be a defeat. How Hitler decided to attack, it is still unclear. In all likelihood, the decisive was the pressure of the Chief of General Staff of the Army. The offensive began on July 5th maneuver, long known to the Russians on numerous previous operations, and therefore beforehand they figured out. Hitler abandoned both of his counterproposals in favor of the Plan Zeitzler, who wanted to destroy the Russian positions put forward in the form of an arc double coverage in the general direction of the city of Tim, and thereby seize the initiative on the eastern on the eastern front again in their hands. From July 10th to July 15th, I visited both advancing fronts, first the southern, then the northern, and clarified on the spot in conversations with tank commanders the course of events, the shortcomings of our tactical methods in offensive combat, and the negative aspects of our equipment. My fears about insufficient preparation of Panther tanks for combat operations at the front were confirmed. 90 Tanks Tiger Porsche, used in the Army of Model, also showed that they do not meet the requirements of close combat. These tanks, as it turned out, were not even sufficiently supplied with ammunition. The situation was exacerbated by the fact that they had no machine guns and therefore, when they broke into the defensive positions of the enemy, literally had to shoot guns at sparrows. They were unable to destroy or suppress enemy infantry fire points and machine gun nests to allow their infantry to advance. They marched out to the Russian artillery positions alone, without infantry. Despite exceptional bravery and unheard of sacrifices, the infantry of Widling's division was unable to capitalize on the success of the tanks. Having advanced about 10 kilometers, Model's troops were stopped. True. There was more success in the south, but it was not enough to block the Russian arc or to lower the resistance. On July 15th began the Russian counteroffensive on Oral, whose defences were weakened in order to free up forces for the offensive. On August 4th the city had to be left. On the same day Belgorod fell. Until that day the units that were in the area of the Zusha River, Oka River northeast of Oral, stubbornly repelled all enemy attacks. This was the very area that I had chosen back in December 1941 for the concentration of my second tank army. Because of this area and I had a conflict with Hitler, which was then used by Field Marshal von Kluge to remove me from office. As a result of the failure of the offensive citadel we suffered a decisive defeat. Armoured troops, replenished with such great difficulty, due to heavy losses in men and equipment for a long time were put out of action. Their timely restoration for the conduct of defensive operations on the Eastern Front, as well as for the organisation of defence in the West in case of landing, which the Allies threatened to land the following spring, was called into question. Needless to say, the Russians rushed to capitalise on their success, and there were no more quiet days on the Eastern Front. The initiative was completely taken over by the enemy. After July 15th, I went to France to inspect tank formations. At the end of July, I visited the formations that had in service tanks Tiger in the training camp Seine near Paderborn. From the camp, I was summoned by Hitler's telegram to East Prussia. During my first report, I fell ill. Dysentery, which I had contracted in Russia and to which I had not even paid attention at first, made me go to bed. Having recovered a little, I flew to Berlin to be finally cured. In the first days of August, I underwent an operation that left me bedridden for the rest of the month. Shortly before the operation, I was visited by General von Tresco, former chief of operations at Field Marshal von Kluge. He told me that he had come on behalf of the Field Marshal, who could reconcile with me if I made the first step towards reconciliation. He wanted to stand with me against Hitler in order to achieve a limitation of the powers of the latter as supreme commander of the armed forces. I could not agree to this proposal, because I knew very well the unstable character of Field Marshal von Kluge. 
Therefore, I was forced to reject the request of General Treskov. My health recovered slowly. Intensified bombardment of Berlin by enemy aircraft in August 1943 disturbed the peace necessary for recovery. Together with my wife, we decided to accept the offer of Speer, who found a villa in a beautiful mountainous area for me at a resort of the imperial government in Upper Austria. As soon as we arrived there on September 3rd, we received news on September 4th that our Berlin apartment had been almost completely destroyed by a direct bomb hit. The remains of our possessions were placed in the basement of one of the barracks in Wunsdorf. It was a heavy blow. We had already begun to think about moving permanently to Upper Austria when we received a telegram that the Reich would grant us the subsidy established by a regulation adopted in the fall of 1942. It was Schmunt, who had learned of the destruction of our house, who made sure that we received such a reimbursement. There was nothing else to do but to be satisfied with this good offer. In October 1943, my wife moved to Diepenhof, where she lived until the Russians arrived there, i.e. until January 20th, 1945. Meanwhile, in my absence, an attempt was made to replace the production of TIV tanks with the production of self-propelled guns. Tot's organization, which was building the Atlantic Rampart and other fortifications, made a proposal to install Panther tank turrets on long-term firing points. This, with our insignificant production of tanks, this was undoubtedly a heavy blow to the command of armored forces. Such a proposal showed an absolute lack of understanding of the role of tanks. Immediately after returning from the resort, I again set about resolving the issue of production of a tank with an anti-aircraft gun. Hitler approved the design of 37mm twin mount. But the 20mm twin mount on the chassis of the TIV tank was rejected by him. And the production of this important defensive weapon had to be postponed again. On October 20th, 1943, Hitler was shown in the training camp Aris wooden model of the tank Tiger II. An extremely successful new model of the tank Tiger, later dubbed by our enemy's Royal Tiger, self-propelled gun firm Vomag, the Tiger self-propelled gun model with a 128mm gun, a 380mm mortar on the chassis of the Tiger tank, a TIII tank with devices for moving along the railway track, as well as light and heavy armoured railroad cars of various types. On October 22nd, enemy aviation made a major raid on the factories of the firm Henschel in Kassel, as a result of which the factories were put out of operation for some time. It turned out that I was right when I predicted enemy air raids on tank factories in the spring. I immediately went to Kassel to the factory to express my sympathy for the workers whose homes were badly destroyed. There were also many dead and wounded. In the broken large assembly hall, I had the opportunity to address the workers. My words did not contain the usual loud phrases of the time, which would have been doubly unacceptable at such a serious moment. I was welcomed by the workers cordially and warmly our mutual understanding was evident in this meeting. This was evidenced by the friendly greetings that I always received from the workers of the plant. November 26th was followed by the second air raid on the Berlin plants Alkit, Rheinmetall, Borzig, Wimag, and Deutsche Waffen und Munitionsfabriken. On December 7th, production of the 38-ton Czech tank was replaced by production of a light self-propelled gun consisting of design elements of the old 38-ton tank with sloping armor plates, a recoilless gun, and a machine gun with a curved barrel. This design could be said to be quite successful. Subsequently, this self-propelled gun began to arm anti-tank divisions of infantry divisions, thus my demands, expressed on March 9th, were finally satisfied. The helplessness of the infantry in the face of the ever-increasing number of Russian tanks led to heavy losses. One evening, Hitler, during a report on the situation, lost his temper and made a long monologue about how pointless to supply infantry divisions with a limited number of anti-tank weapons. By chance and I was present at this report. When Hitler poured out his soul, I stood just in front of him. The expression on my face must have seemed to him to some extent sarcastic, because he suddenly stopped talking, looked at me and said, you were right. That's what you told me nine months ago. Unfortunately, I didn't listen to you. 
Finally, I could realize my intention, but unfortunately too late. Only one third of the anti-tank companies could be armed with the new weapons before the Russian offensive began in the winter of 1945. This is how our, our armored forces developed until the end of 1943. The situation at the front in the second half of 1943 continued to develop not in our favor. Volkhov, northeast Chudovo, along the line south of Schlisselburg, south of Leningrad, south of Uranium Balm to the coast of the Gulf of Finland. On this front, the Russians continued to strike primarily at Army Groups A, south and center. The Russian offensive in the direction of Stalin from July 16 to 24 failed. But the strike of 52 infantry formations and 10 tank corps led to a deep inclination of the Russians in the direction of Kharkov, Poltava. The breakthrough was eliminated, but Kharkov on August 20 was lost. During the offensive, which began on August 24 from the line Taganrog, Voroshilovgrad, the Russians still managed to make a breakthrough. Our front until September 8 had to move to the line Mariupol, west of Stalin, west of Slavyansk. Until mid-September we had to leave the line along the Donets River, by the end of this month the Russians were in front of Melitopol, on the outskirts of Zaporozhye and at the mouth of the Pripyat. On July 11th began Russian attacks north of Kursk against Army Group Center, which on August 5th led to the capture of Oral. From August 26th to September 4th, the enemy managed to wedge deeply in the direction of Kornatop, Nizhin. In the following days, this wedge was widened. At the end of September, the Russians reached the Dnieper near the confluence of the Pripyat River. From here, the front went through Gomo, east of the Dnieper northward to Velizh. In the second half of October, the Russians forced the Dnieper between Dnieper Petrovsky, Kremenchug. At the end of the month, our front was broken through south of Zaporozhye, and the troops were pushed back behind the Dnieper by mid November. Two pre-bridge fortifications remained, one at Nikopol and the other, a small one, at Kherson. Between November 3rd and 13, the Russians captured Kiev and advanced to Zetomir. Hitler decided to launch a counter-offensive. Following his bad habit, he decided to conduct it very weak forces. With the consent of the chief of the general staff of the army, I used my report to Hitler on November 9th, 1943 on armoured forces to make a proposal for an offensive. I proposed to Hitler to abandon the individual, scattered in place and time counterattacks, and to concentrate all available panzer divisions located in the area south of Kiev for the planned counteroffensive through Berdyshev to Kiev. I also proposed to pull up here a tank division from the area of pre-bridge fortification near Nikopol, which was defended by Shorna and tank divisions of Army Group Kleist, defending along the Dnieper River near Kherson. When talking with Hitler, I adhered to my old principle. To hit, so hit he knew about this principle, but never followed it. My proposal was taken into account, but the objections of frontline commanders forced Hitler to abandon it, started by weak forces counter-offensive at Berdych after heavy winter fighting stalled. It was not possible to capture Kiev and reach the Dnieper line. On December 24, 1943, the Russians started to attack again and pushed back our troops from Berdychev to Vinitsa. The introduction of the 25th Panzer Division into the battle is extremely characteristic of Hitler's offensive tactics. However, to cover this episode, I must go back a bit. After the disaster at Stalingrad, I formed several tank divisions from the remnants of defeated divisions, tank soldiers whose soldiers due to injury illness and other reasons managed to avoid capture. I did the same with the escaped remnants of troops after the loss of Africa. The 21st Armoured Division was created in France from occupation units armed with trophy material. The 25th Armoured Division was formed in a similar manner in Norway. Its commander was General von Schell. Schell had worked with me in the Reichswehr Ministry when I worked from 1927 to 1930. I was in charge of automobile troops. He then went on an extended business trip to the United States to study motorization in Henry Ford's country. From there he arrived with many plans in his mind. 
Before the war, he had been head of the Armoured Forces Inspectorate's Armoured Forces Motorised Division in the Directorate of General Affairs of the Army and, hence the chief advisor on the motorization of the army. Hitler took a keen interest in the problem, so the two worked closely together. Schell was an intelligent, determined and very eloquent man. He was able to convince Hitler in the expediency of simplifying the types of machines and the need to establish mass production. As a result, he was appointed junior state secretary in the Imperial Ministry of Transportation, which is a rare case in Germany. There he worked on the development of motor vehicles. In his activities, he soon encountered resistance from industrialists and party authorities associated with them, who did not want to abandon their old methods of production. These circles undermined Hitler's confidence in Shell, and Hitler relieved him of his position. Shell was transferred to Norway, a quiet country where he could not reap the laurels of war. But the agile, fatigue-free man soon created from the meagre occupation units of a combat-ready unit. I supported his desire to deploy this unit in the tank division and achieved the transfer of his compound in France. However, after the collapse of the planned Citadel Eastern Front took all the forces from France and so weakened the occupation units there that required replenishment. Naturally, the trophy material part of this new formation had to be replaced with domestic modern equipment. The men had to be trained to use the equipment and to operate as part of the unit. The division had to be familiarized with the experience of fighting on the Eastern Front, and only then to give it a feasible task in accordance with the level of its training. And what happened? In early October 1943, Hitler ordered this division to transfer to the Eastern Front for the formed 14th Panzer Division more than 600 newly received vehicles. The High Command of the Armed Forces and the General Command of Land Forces believed that the 25th Panzer Division would be in France for a long time and therefore could do without them, being satisfied with low-quality French equipment. This severely degraded the armament of the division, which could now only be used in the Western theatre. The reconnaissance battalion of the armoured division was being equipped at this time with armoured personnel carriers. The sappers and the 1st Battalion of the 146th Motorised Regiment also received new armoured personnel carriers. The 9th Tank Regiment was not yet fully equipped. The 91st Artillery Regiment was to receive German light-field howitzers and 100mm guns instead of Polish trophy guns. The anti-aircraft division lacked one battery. The anti-tank division a company of self-propelled guns. There was not enough means of radio communication. All these shortcomings were known. They had to be eliminated in a calm situation in France. Despite all this, in mid-October came the order to transfer the division to the east. I immediately protested and asked Hitler to wait until a secondary inspection of this compound. I wanted to get a clear picture of the combat capabilities of the division, so as not to throw it completely unprepared in heavy fighting on the Eastern Front. I immediately went to France. After inspecting the division and extensive conversations with Shell and other commanders, I reported that the division needs at least four weeks to receive in arms new equipment and general familiarization with it. This message I conveyed by telephone. But the order to move the division to the east had already been sent. Hitler, the supreme command of the armed forces and the general command of the land forces, did not take into account neither the reports of the commanders of the units, nor the message of the person in charge, Inspector General. The transfer of the division to the Eastern Front was scheduled for October 29th. The division was not capable. Not only that, the order of transfer to the east did not correspond to the desire of the division command, nor to the situation at the front. In addition, on the way this order was repeatedly subjected to changes. The anti-tank division was distributed by guns throughout the echelon. To increase the combat effectiveness of the division, I ordered to give it the newly formed 509th Tank Battalion of Tanks Tiger, although the armament of this battalion was not yet fully completed. At the same time, an order was issued to appoint a new battalion commander on departure from France. The old commander had already left, and the new one had not yet arrived. 
The division was hastily transferred to the area of operations of Army Group South. The headquarters of the group indicated for wheeled transport of the division the unloading area Berdichev, Kazatine, for tracked units the area Kirovograd, Novo Ukrenka, and the division command did not know where to include artillery tractors and armoured personnel carriers. One unloading area was located from the other at a distance of about three days' march. The chief of staff of the division with the previously arrived personnel went through Berdyshev to Novo Ukrenka. The division commander went to report to the headquarters of the army group in Vinitsa. In Berdichev, a specially appointed officer supervised the unloading and concentration of units and subdivisions on wheeled transport. B. November was to begin the march to the areas of concentration. There was no telephone communication with the unloaded units. Orders were delivered by special officers in cars. On November 5th, the enemy managed to cut deep into Kiev. On November 6th, Army Group gave the following order the 25th Panzer Division is subordinated to the 4th Panzer Army. On November 6th, it must begin moving units on wheeled transport to the area of Bila Turkfa. The area of concentration is Bila Turkfa. Fastov. The division is guarded by its own forces. The tracked units should be brought from the Kirovograd area. Army Group knew about the state of this division. At 16 o'clock, the division commander gathered the commanders who had time to arrive to him to give them the order. There was only one one three hundred thousand map for all regimental and battalion commanders. By this time, the tank division commander had the following units at his disposal. 146th Motorized Regiment Regimental Headquarters, two part-time battalions. 147th Motorized Regiment, the same. 9th Tank Regiment Regimental Headquarters, 2nd Battalion Headquarters, units of various companies, total of 30 TIV tanks and 15 Tiger tanks. 91st Artillery Regiment Regimental Headquarters, headquarters of the 1st Division, 1st and 2nd Batteries in addition, personnel of the 3rd Division without guns. Anti-Tank Division Headquarters and 1 Mixed Battery. Communications Battalion nearly complete, but without a commander, who was with the forward units. Engineer battalion in full strength, without a light engineer column and a bridge column. Anti-aircraft division headquarters and first battery. Under the division commander were only an adjutant, two commissioned officers with a few motor cars and a few liaisons on motorcycles. In view of the situation, the division commander decided to move through Kazatine, Skvira several marching columns, the composition of which was determined by the readiness of units to march and their distance from the starting point of the division, and go to the area west of Bila Tsurkva. In this area he wanted to wait for the approach of all his units. He believed that on November B he would not be able to move out before 22 hours, because the transfer of the order to the units with the help of vehicles took a lot of time. The radios had not yet arrived, moreover, the use of radio for camouflage purposes was forbidden. When the commanders left for their units, an order came from the headquarters of the 4th Tank Army, with which the telephone connection was maintained. The 25th Tank Division immediately reached Fastov and hold it by all means. The commander of the 25th Panzer Division is appointed head of the garrison of the city of Fastov. He will be subordinated to two spare Tyrolean battalions and one battalion formed from vacationers, as well as the SS Regiment of the Reich Tank Grenadier Division arriving in the evening. Then the route was indicated Kazatine, Skvira, Popelnia, Fastov, but it had to be abandoned, because the partisans blew up the bridges for the movement chose a field road east of Skvira. The division commander decided to be at the head of the first marching column. The march began exactly at the appointed time and passed at first quietly. In the second half of the night met retreating columns of aviation units, which broke the pace of the march of the division. This required vigorous intervention of the division commander. The hitherto dry weather had changed for the worse, and for several days in a row it rained continuously, badly washing out the roads. Only tracked vehicles could advance on such roads, Wheeled vehicles had to make large detours. Communication between the marching columns was broken. 
On November 7th, at about 12 noon, soldiers arriving from Fastov brought the news that the enemy had already broken into the city. The division commander with one commissioned officer quickly moved forward to prepare an attack on Fastov. Caught on the road under rifle and machine gun fire, they both boarded armoured personnel carriers. Suddenly, the armoured personnel carriers ran into Russian T-34 tanks. The 9th Company of the 146th Motorized Regiment, which was following the division commander with four heavy infantry guns, came under fire. Panic ensued. The division commander rushed to the front. The 2nd Battalion of the 146th Motorized Regiment of the division, which was behind in the column. He saw that this battalion had begun to retreat, however, the division commander managed to stop it, put it in order, and lead it out to trials. He stayed with the battalion to prevent panic, and ordered it to entrench. Evening came. During the night, Russian tanks attacked the battalion's transport and partially put it out of action. The division commander decided to break through the enemy tanks operating around them at night in the direction of Fastov and join up with the forward units of his division. One infantry company was at the head of this small fighting group, the other at the tail the vehicles and heavy weapons were in the middle. General von Schell moved at the head of the column. With heavy fighting at about 4 a.m. On November 8th, he managed to get out of the ring of Russian tanks and by 2 p.m. he had reached White Church. Reached White Church, where was the command post of the 47th Panzer Corps, to which the division was transferred. Meanwhile, other parts of the division under the command of Colonel Baron von Weimar were already advancing through Grybenki, Slavia to Fastov. On the morning of November 9th, General von Schell went to these units. The village of Fastovitz, located east of Fastov, was in enemy hands and had to be attacked. The units under the personal command of the division commander took this village by midday and began the attack on Fastov. The enemy suffered heavy losses. On November 10th, the advancing reached the suburbs of Fastov, but encountered strong enemy resistance on its eastern and southern outskirts they had to be satisfied with clearing Slavia from the enemy. But the further advance of the Russians was still stopped. Tank division, insufficiently trained, poorly staffed and in addition scattered in different areas, fell into an extremely difficult situation in which she, despite the personal involvement of General von Schell, it was difficult to succeed. True, it inflicted heavy losses on the enemy, but also suffered considerable damage. Because of the lack of combat experience, the units at first often succumbed to panic until the soldiers and officers are not accustomed to the difficult conditions of war in the eastern winter. Due to the lack of forces, the command was forced to immediately throw the division into battle. Without regard to the above factors, however, he can be reproached for not knowing how to handle the newly formed units sparingly. In the battles from December 24 to 30, 1943, this unfortunate division was again in a difficult situation on a front 40 km wide. It was attacked by superior enemy forces and crushed. The division suffered such heavy losses that it had to be almost reformed. Hitler and the general command of land forces decided to disband it. But I began to object, as the personnel was not to blame for the fate of the division. General von Schell became seriously ill and had to leave the front. He felt very strongly about the unjustified defeat of his division, which he had created with great love and skill for many months. Hitler's distrust led to the fact that this general was not appointed to a new command position. His capacity for work as well as his great organisational and teaching talent, went unheeded. In order to do something for the Western Front, I ordered the consolidation of all training units of military schools into one tank training division. This division, which was trained in France, received a new material part. It was sent specially selected officers. Its commander was appointed my former chief of operations, General Bayerlein. In December, Hitler officially authorised the formation of this division. Unexpected help, which I did not count on. Meanwhile, at the front of the uninterrupted persistent fighting. At the front of Army Group Center, Russian managed to make a breakthrough in the area of Rikitsa between Pripyat and Berezina. 
Fierce battles were fought for Neville and Vitebskirk. Gomo and Propoisk were lost. Only to the east of Mogaev and Orsha we still had a pre-bridge fortification on the eastern bank of the Dnieper. The question legitimately arose whether it still makes sense to keep the pre-bridge fortifications on the Dnieper in such a situation, when perhaps forever excluded the resumption of the offensive in the eastern direction. At Nikopol, Hitler wanted to continue mining manganese. The reason for this stubbornness was his military economic point of view, generally wrong and, as we believed, harmful in operational terms. It was better to withdraw behind wide water lines, to allocate reserves, primarily tank divisions, and with these forces to conduct manoeuvrable combat operations. But when Hitler heard the word operate, he was furious, believing that the generals under this word means a continuous retreat, and therefore with fanatical stubbornness insisted on holding the terrain even where it caused great harm. Heavy bloody winter battles completely knocked the main command of the land forces out of the rut. There was no question of preparing forces for the West, where in the spring of 1944 the Allied powers were certain to land an amphibious assault. Therefore I felt that I was doing my duty when I constantly reminded of the timely removal of tank divisions from the front for their replenishment in the rear. Although the supreme command of the armed forces, and should have given this important theatre of operations the greatest attention, it did not give me any support, so delayed the release of forces for the Western Front, until I finally once again reported it to Hitler in the presence of Zeitzler. It was about the removal of one panzer division. Zeitzler reported that already ordered its withdrawal. I had to contradict him and say that the orders of the general command of the land forces usually contain loopholes for selfish frontline generals. On the part of the chief of general staff, my remark met with an angry protest. However, for example, his last order to withdraw the division contained the following words removed from the front, as soon as possible tank division X, if the situation allows. Battle groups to leave until special order in front of the enemy front. On the beginning of the removal of the division to report, the words until special order in the orders of the general command of the army were always printed in abbreviated form D. O. PR from this we can conclude that they were used in them often or almost always. The consequence of such an order was that the commander of a group of armies or an army who was ordered to remove a division from the front stated that the combat situation did not allow to do so, and until it finally allowed, often weeks passed. The combat groups that remained at the front included, of course, the most combat-ready units of the division, and first of all tanks and motorised infantry which were mainly in need of replenishment. Consequently, practically first arrived in the rear of the transport columns that did not require replenishment, then the division headquarters and artillery, in its composition still capable of combat operations. With this arrangement I could not proceed to fulfil my main task, as the main combat units were still at the front. Zeitzler was very angry with me, but we were not entitled to neglect the interests of the Western Front. Before the beginning of the invasion of the continent on June 6, 1944, somehow managed to collect, replenish and train ten tank and ten motorised divisions. But about that later, training these compounds, to which were added three more armoured divisions from the reserve, transferred from the Empire to France, I entrusted my old tried and tested colleague General Baron von Geyer which Hitler never wanted to entrust the command of the compounds at the front because of numerous disagreements with him. Geyer's command position was called General of the Panzer Units of the West. In territorial and operational terms, he was subordinate to the Commander-in-Chief of the Troops in the Westfield Marshal von Rundstedt and for service in the Armoured Forces Me. In working together we had complete confidence in each other, and I believe that our work benefited the Army. Speaking about such an eventful year of 1943, I should mention a few more meetings. I have already mentioned that on my first visit to Goebbels, I began a conversation with him about the mistakes of the high command and asked him to induce Hitler to reorganise, in particular, to establish a full-fledged position of chief of the general staff of the armed forces. 
This was to reduce Hitler's personal influence on the conduct of operations. True, Goebbels called this issue very sensitive, but still in due course promised to assist me. When the minister came to East Prussia at the end of June 1943, I visited him again and reminded him of our first conversation. Goebbels immediately recognized the ever-increasing deterioration of the military situation and said reflectively, whenever I imagine that the Russians will come to Berlin, that it will be necessary to poison my wife and children so that they do not fall into the hands of cruel enemies. Then your question always acts on my soul as some kind of nightmare Goebbels clearly understood the consequences to which the further conduct of the war by our old methods might lead, but he drew no conclusions from it. He never tried to talk to Hitler about my proposals or to influence him. I therefore tried to probe Himmler's opinion on the matter, but encountering his overwhelming obstinacy, I refused to discuss with him the question of limiting Hitler's powers. In November, I went to Jodl and outlined to him a draft organization of the High Command, according to which the Chief of the General Staff of the Armed Forces should carry out the actual leadership of operations, Hitler should be limited to his own field of activity, policy and general issues of warfare. When I thoroughly justified my proposal, Iodel laconically replied, Do you know a better commander-in-chief than Adolf Hitler? His face froze in a fixed mina, and his whole posture expressed cold refusal. I quickly grabbed my draft and left his office. In January 1944, Hitler invited me to breakfast. I was presented with a teal. You know I am a vegetarian. Let's have breakfast together. The two of us ate breakfast together in a small, sparsely lit room with only one window at a small round table. Only Blondie the sheepdog sat in the room. Hitler fed her slices of stale bread. Servant Lynge, who served us, came in and silently, noiselessly went out. It was a rare opportunity to raise and discuss sensitive issues. After a few introductory phrases, I turned the conversation to martial law. I began to talk about the intention of the Allied powers to land an amphibious assault on the mainland in the spring, noting that the reserves at our disposal were insufficient. To free up more forces, it is necessary to give the Eastern Front a more stable defensive character. I am surprised that no one thinks about strengthening the front with reliable fortifications, no one cares about creating rear defensive lines. After all, the restoration of old German and Russian fortifications creates, in my opinion, better conditions for defence than declaring open places fortified areas, and this is done, as a rule, at the last moment, when nothing can be done to justify this name. With my words I immediately hit a hornet's nest. Believe me, I am the greatest engineer builder of fortifications of all time. I built the western rampart, I built the Atlantic rampart. I have used up so many and so many tons of concrete. I know what it means to build fortifications. For the East we have no manpower, no materials, no means of transportation. Already now the railway transport cannot cope with the supply of the front, I cannot send echelons of construction material to the front, as well he kept many figures well in his head and trumped, as always, accurate data, which no one at the moment would be able to immediately refute. But in spite of all this I began to object strenuously. I knew that the railroad network works poorly only east of Brest, and so I tried to explain to Hitler that my proposed work to strengthen the area will not require any transport to bring materials to the front, it will be necessary to bring them only to the boundary of the river's west bug, Niemann, with which the railroads can cope. We can find in our country both labour and building materials. We can continue the war on two fronts with the hope of success only if at least on one front there is a lull even if temporary, but still allowing us to do something to strengthen the other front. Once you have strengthened the West well, there is no obstacle to doing the same for the East. Pushed against the wall, Hitler seized on his long-known argument that the generals of the Eastern Front will only think of retreat if he in the rear behind their front to build reliable defensive fortifications and facilities. Nothing could make him change this preconceived opinion. Then came the talk of generals and the high command. It was clear that my attempt to achieve by indirect means the concentration of military command in one body 
and to limit Hitler's direct influence had failed. Therefore I now considered it my duty to propose to Hitler himself to appoint some general whom he trusted as chief of the general staff of the armed forces in order to establish a successful management of operations and to eliminate the clutter of headquarters. But this attempt also completely failed. Hitler did not want to part with Field Marshal Kietel. He immediately felt that he wanted to limit his power. I never achieved anything. Was there even one general that Hitler trusted? After this conversation, it became clear to me that this question can only be answered in the negative. So everything remained the same. For every square meter, there were persistent battles. The stalemate was never improved by a timely withdrawal. But more than once, Hitler, looking at me with a withering look, asked I do not know why for two years we have been unlucky in everything, but did not pay attention to my constant answer change the way of action. The year 1944 began on the Eastern Front with persistent Russian attacks in mid-January. At first, the Russians were driven back from Kirovograd. On January 24th and 26th, they began to take in pincers our protruding arc positions west of Cherkasy, on January 30th followed by a blow to our protrusion east of Kirovograd. Both offensives were successful. The superiority of the Russians was significant. In the offensive participated. In front of the front of army groups, South Ukraine, 34 rifle and 11 tank formations. In front of the front of army group, Northern Ukraine, 67 rifle and 52 tank formations. In the second half of February, there was relative calm at the front, but on March 3rd, 4 and 5, the Russians began to attack again and pushed back our front behind the Zap, Bug River. Army Group Center basically managed to hold its front until the end of March. In April, in the south, almost all Crimea was lost. The southern Bug, as well as the Prut and Seret rivers in the upper reaches, were forced. Chernivtsi passed into the hands of the enemy. Then, after the failed major Russian offensive in the area and after the loss of Sevastopol, there was a lull until August. In January, the enemy launched an offensive against the Army Group North. At first, he managed to achieve only small successes north of Lake Ilmen and southwest of Leningrad. However, on January 21st, he put into battle large forces and pushed back our front behind the Luga River and in February behind the Narva River. At the end of March, the Germans were pushed back behind the Velikaya River and behind the Chudskoy and Piskov lakes. Here we managed to gain a foothold. Until June 22nd, there was a lull on the Eastern Front. During the winter campaign was used up a lot of forces. There were no reserves. All those who could be dispensed with here had to be transferred to the Atlantic Rampart, which in fact was not a rampart, but only a sham fortification to intimidate the enemy. At this time to my share fell to another unpleasant assignment Hitler. As always, now he needed scapegoats on whom to blame for the retreat and failures that we suffered during the past winter. Among others, he held Colonel General Janica responsible for the loss of the Crimea. He made it clear that statements by major party workers on the subject had confirmed him in the suspicion that had arisen. I was given the task of investigating Janik, with the indication that someone must be victimized for the loss of Crimea with Hitler's mood at the time. Only a prolonged investigation could do any good. I took up the case very thoroughly, questioning everyone who had anything to do with the case, and with particular care the party workers. Janik began to complain about the slow pace of the investigation but I am convinced that the acquittal which was finally handed down to him did him more good than a quick investigation and a report of its results at an inopportune time would have done. As already mentioned, as early as 1943 I was intensely concerned with the question of the defence of the Western Front. By the beginning of the new year this question had assumed even greater importance. In February I went to France to inspect and talk with Field Marshal von Rundstedt and General Baron von Geyer. All of us were of the same opinion that with the superiority of the enemy in the fleet and aircraft defence will be very difficult. Especially adversely affect the enemy's superiority in the air on the movement of troops. Apparently they will have to be made quickly and only at night. 
In our opinion, in the first place we'll have to create sufficient reserves of armoured and motorised divisions and place them at such a distance from the so-called Atlantic Rampart, so that it was possible to transfer them as soon as the front of the invasion is determined. In advance it will be necessary to prepare a network of roads and crossing facilities to build bridges. When inspecting the troops immediately realised how great was the superiority of the enemy in the air, the enemy's aviation units now and then made flights over our troops who were on exercises, and no one was sure that the enemy would refuse the unexpected bombing blessing of our training march. Arriving at the Fuhrer's main headquarters, I inquired about the orders and instructions that had been given by the general staff of the armed forces to the Western Front and about the available reserves. At the same time it turned out that the tank divisions, furnishing the basis of the army, were located in coastal areas. In the event of an enemy landing in another area opposite to our assumptions, it would hardly be possible to move them with sufficient speed to new areas of combat operations. In my report to Hitler I mentioned this error and suggested a different distribution of motorised troops. Hitler objected the chosen distribution is based on the suggestions of Field Marshal Rommel. I would not want to give orders through the head of the field marshal in charge of these matters, moreover, in his absence. Go again to France and talk again about it with Rommel. In April I again went to France. The enemy aircraft further intensified their actions and began to make operational bombing. Thus our training camp at Cam de May was completely destroyed soon after my inspection. It was only thanks to the foresight of General Baron von Geyer that we did not suffer significant losses, since the troops and material had been placed in villages and forests away from the camp. After a second conversation with Field Marshal von Rundstedt and with the officers of his staff on the organisation of reserves, I went, as I was advised by Hitler, together with Geyer to Field Marshal Rommel in La roche -Garn. I had known Rommel before the war. He was the commander of the Goslar Jagger Battalion, from which I came, and I always maintained the best friendly relations with him. We then met during the Polish campaign, when in September 1939 Hitler visited my corpse after the battle in the corridor. Rommel was then commandant of the Führer's main headquarters. He later moved into armoured forces and successfully commanded the 7th Panzer Division. in France in 1940, and then a corps and tank army in Africa. These battles brought him military fame. Rommel possessed not only an open, direct character, was not only a brave soldier he was, among other things, a military leader of great talent. It was an energetic man with refined feelings. He always found a way out of the most difficult situation, very fond of his soldiers and rightly enjoyed great authority in the past years. We often met for conversations to share combat experience, and always found a common language. In September 1942, Rommel, returning to Germany due to illness, asked Hitler to appoint me to Africa as his deputy, although he knew about my quarrel with the Führer. At the time, this proposal was sharply rejected. This was my good fortune, because soon came the news of the defeat at El Alamein, which in all probability I would not have been able to prevent, as it failed Stumm and those who succeeded him nor would Rommel himself have been able to do so. Sad experience, which Rommel received in Africa, so convinced him of the significant superiority of the Western powers in the air, that he ruled out the possibility of any movement of large formations. He also did not believe in the possibility of night movements of armoured and motorised divisions. In this opinion he was convinced by his own experience in Italy in 1943. General Baron von Geyer's report on the organisation of mobile reserves behind the Atlantic Front, in which he defended the manoeuvring use of these forces and create a grouping appropriate to this task, contradicted Rommel's point of view. I knew of the negative outcome of their meeting. Therefore, I was not surprised by the very hot and strong protest Rommel when I began to talk about the withdrawal of tank forces from the coast. Rommel flatly rejected this proposal, pointing out that I, a soldier of the Eastern Front, I do not know the experience of Africa and Italy, that this is its advantage, so he does not intend to mislead himself about his beliefs.
dispute with Rommel on the question of the organization of motorized reserves did not promise in connection with this situation no results. Seeing such a clear protest, I gave up further attempts to convince Rommel and decided to once again present my opinion on the matter to Rundstedt and Hitler. It was clear to me that the Western Front will not receive neither tank nor motorized divisions beyond those that are currently available here. Only two SS divisions, given in the spring on loan to the east, were to be returned to the west during the invasion of the mainland. Therefore I could not promise Rommel anything but these two divisions. The overall leadership of the troops in the West could only be facilitated by releasing for them the reserves of the High Command and giving the commander of these troops unlimited rights over the group of armies Rommel. Neither of these things happened. Rommel, having taken command over Army Group B in France, did a lot in his area to strengthen the defensive strength of the Atlantic Berm. In accordance with the instruction received to consider the coast as the main defensive strip, he provided the pre-field defences of the coast with various obstacles, placing them in the water. In the rear areas where he considered likely to land airborne troops, he installed wire barriers, the so-called Rommel's asparagus. Many areas of terrain were mined. All units under his command, all free time from classes, had to devote to trench work. In Army Group B life was boiling. Recognising the need for all these efforts, at the same time it is necessary to regret that Rommel could not understand the full significance of mobile reserves. Carrying out mobile forces of a major ground operation, which in conditions of absolute superiority of the enemy in the air and at sea would give us in the hands of the only trump card, he considered impossible therefore, he did not seek to implement it. To this it must be added that Rommel, at least at the time of my visit, held a prejudiced view of the probable landing area. He repeatedly assured me that the British and Americans, in all probability, will land north of the mouth of the Somme. Without recognising any other possibilities, he justified his opinion by the fact that the enemy, undertaking such a difficult naval operation by large forces, only for reasons of supply will have to choose for the landing of the landing force in this area, which is at a minimum distance from its loading ports. His confidence in the correctness of his point of view was reinforced by the possibility of freer air support for the landing force in the area north of the Somme River. In this matter, he then rejected any objection. On all these issues, Rommel's views converged with Hitler, although for different reasons. Hitler was and remained a soldier of trench warfare of the period 1914 to 1918. He never understood manoeuvre warfare. Rommel on the other hand, believed that it was impossible to conduct manoeuvre warfare in the face of enemy air superiority. Therefore, it is not surprising that Hitler, who considered the more recent combat experience of Rommel undeniable, rejected Voyer proposals for the organisation of motorised formations, which made him the commander-in-chief of the troops in the West and I. June 6, 1944, the day of the enemy's invasion of the mainland in France were 48 infantry divisions, 38 of them on the front line and 10 divisions in the front rear, with five of the latter divisions between the Scheldt and Somme rivers, two divisions between the Somme and Seine rivers, and three rivers, and three divisions in Brittany. Ten panzer and motorised divisions, of which the first SS panzer division Adolf Hitler was at Bevelot, the second panzer division was in the area of Amiens, Abbeville. The 116th Panzer Division was east of Rouen, the 12th S Panzer Division Hitler Jugend. Was at Lisieux, the 21st Panzer Division was at Caen, tank training division in the area of Le Mans, Orleans, Chartres, 17th SS Motor Division in the area of Salma, Niort, Poitiers, 11th Tank Division in the area of Bordeaux, 2nd SS Tank Division Reich. In the area of Montauban, Toulouse, 9th Tank Division in the area of Avignon, Nimes Arles. All hope for the success of the defence was tied to these 10 tank and motorised divisions. With difficulty managed to some extent to replenish and train these divisions, one of these divisions Rommel had in his command four divisions too, 116th and 21st Panzer Divisions and the 12th SS Panzer Division. The 1st SSS Panzer Division, the Tank Training Division, 
and the 11th SS Motorized Division were assigned to the reserve of the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces. The 9th and 11th SS Panzer Divisions and the 2nd SS Panzer Division were in southern France in case of a landing on the Mediterranean coast. Such a dispersal of forces from the very beginning excluded the possibility of conducting a successful defence, and the course of events, moreover, was so unhappy that nothing worse could be imagined. On the day of the enemy's invasion of the mainland, Rommel was on his way to Germany. He was on his way to report to Hitler. Hitler, as usual, went to bed very late, and June 6th, when the first reports arrived, he did not dare to disturb him. Jodl, who led the operations in Hitler's absence, could not decide to immediately use the reserve of the supreme command of the armed forces, even in three panzer divisions, because he did not know whether the landing in Normandy is the main operation or it is made in order to mislead us. Since the supreme command of the armed forces did not have clarity on the possibility of landing the enemy on the Mediterranean coast, it also did not pull up armoured divisions from southern France. The 21st Armoured Division, which stood in the area of the enemy invasion, was to the beginning of its counterattack tied up with the consent of Rommel and contrary to the orders of General Baron von Geyer to perform other tasks and thus missed the right moment to attack the landing units of the British. 116th Panzer Division Rommel pulled up even closer to the coast, in the area of Dieppe, and kept it there until mid-July. Ignorance of some of the major chiefs of the tactics of the use of tanks led to the fact that orders were given to march in the daytime under the influence of enemy aircraft. This applies primarily to the training tank division. Frontal counterattacks in the area of the enemy ship artillery prematurely exhausted the only combat-ready forces that the German Reich could oppose the invasion. Armoured units suffered monstrous losses because of the disastrous situation in the east. They could no longer be made up, because after June 22nd, the threat of a complete collapse of the Eastern Front imperatively demanded the supply of reserves of this front, which had once been neglected in favour of the West. The prevention of invasion would have been greatly facilitated if Hitler and the high command of the armed forces had followed the suggestion of General Baron von Geyer and the Inspector General of Armoured Forces. They demanded that all tank and motorised divisions of the Western Front be divided into two groups, placed in combat readiness north and south of Paris, and carefully prepared for night marches to the actual invasion front. But in the end, even from the positions taken, more could have been accomplished with dedicated leadership. As late as June 16th, two weeks after the invasion began, the 116th Armoured Division was on the coast between Abbeville and Dieppe, the 11th Armoured Division near Bordeaux, the 9th Armoured Division near Avignon, the SS Reich Panzer Division was fighting partisans in southern France. At this time the remaining divisions, together with the 9th and 10th SS Panzer Divisions arriving from the Eastern Front, exhausted their strength in heavy frontal attacks by the enemy, who was supported by shipboard artillery. In addition to these panzer divisions, on this day seven other infantry divisions north of the Seine were idle near the coast awaiting an enemy landing, which was never landed in the area. Turning to particulars, the following may be reported. June 7th, General Baron von Geyer took command of the compounds in the area of Cayenne, which were first in the 7th Army, and then in Army Group B, the 12th SS Panzer Division and the Tank Training Division, were introduced into the fight to the left of the already fighting 21st Panzer Division. On June 10th, General Baron von Geyer wanted to launch a counterattack, but a successful attack by enemy bombers knocked out the headquarters of the Panzer Group West. The leadership of the battle passed to the headquarters of the 1st SS Panzer Corps. With a delay of several days at different times and in different areas entered the battle SS Division Adolf Hitler and the 2nd Panzer Division. On June 28, the newly formed headquarters of the Panzer Group West again took command of the 1st and 2nd SS Panzer Corps, the 86th and 47th Panzer Corps. General Baron von Geyer's proposals to launch an all-out offensive were rejected by Rommel, who had lost faith in the success of the offensive. Whether there were other political reasons that justified the late and not centralised introduction of reserves into the battle remains unproven. 
On June 28, the commander of the 7th Army, Colonel General Dolman, died. Colonel General Hasse was appointed in his place. On June 29, Hitler held a meeting of the generals of the Western Front in Obersalzburg. The meeting was also attended by Field Marshals von Rundstedt, Spurl and Rommel. Here I saw Rommel for the last time. I again had the same impression, as in late April at his headquarters in La roche guyon that Rommel, being under the influence of the consciousness of superiority of the enemy in the air, excludes the possibility of manoeuvre defence. At this meeting was primarily concerned with strengthening our formations of fighter aviation. Goering promised to give 800 fighters if Spurl can provide the necessary number of pilots. But this Spurl could not do. He had, as far as I remember, only 500 crews. This message aroused Hitler's anger. The sad outcome of the day was soon followed by the removal of Rundstedt, Gaia and Spurl from their posts. Rundstedt's place was taken by Field Marshal von Kluge, who had already been in the Führer's main headquarters for several weeks, studying the general situation in order to be on hand in case of need. Mr. Von Kluge was then at Hitler's desirable person. The new command of the troops in the West, which took over on July 6, was not in a position to change anything in the course of events. Field Marshal von Kluge arrived in France with a mood created under the influence of optimism reigning in the Führer's headquarters. First of all, he had a clash with Rommel, but soon had to agree with his very sober assessment of the situation. Mr. Von Kluge was a diligent soldier, a good tactician on a small scale, but he understood nothing about the issues of the use of tank formations in manoeuvre warfare. His influence on the management of tank formations where I had to face him was negative. He was a master at crushing compounds. It is not surprising, therefore, that the command of troops in the West continued to put patches instead of suppressing the evil at the root and waging manoeuvre warfare with the remaining able-to-move tank formations. These surviving mobile forces were exhausted and exsanguinated in frontal counterattacks against an enemy supported by powerful shipboard artillery. On July 11th, Kane fell. July 17th, British bombers attacked the car Rommel, driving around the front. The driver was seriously wounded and Field Marshal thrown out of the car and with a fractured skull and a number of other injuries taken to the hospital. In his person, the Western theatre of war lost the strongest personality. On this day, the front line passed from the mouth of the Orne River through the southern outskirts of the cities of Caen. Carmont Saint. Low, Lesse to the coast. While on the Normandy front, the deployed advanced units of the Western Allies were preparing to break through our front from the captured pre bridge fortification, which created an extremely tense situation for us. On the Eastern front, events were developing that were directly approaching a monstrous catastrophe. On June 22, 1944, Along the entire front of Army Group Center, commanded by Field Marshal Bush, the Russians went on the offensive, bringing into battle 146 infantry divisions and 43 tank formations. They achieved complete success. By July 3rd, Russian troops reached the Pripyat swamps, reaching the line Baranovici, Molodekno, Kozieni. From these boundaries, the offensive unstoppable stream rushed further, spilled over to the section of Army Group North and by mid-July the front line passed through Pinsk, Prusiny, Volkovysk, Grodno, Kovno, Binsk, Piskov. On the main directions the offensive seemed to continue non-stop. After July 13th, the offensive began to spread to the front of Army Group A and the enemy troops reached the line of Peremyshal San Puloi. San Puloi. As a result of this blow Army Group Center was destroyed. We suffered enormous losses, about 25 divisions. As a result of these stunning events, Hitler in mid-July moved his headquarters from Obersalzburg to East Prussia. All available forces were thrown into the collapsing front. Field Marshal Model, commander of Army Group A, was appointed instead of Field Marshal Busch, commander of Army Group Center, or rather the commander of the empty space. Since one man could not long bear the burden of dual responsibilities, the commander of Army Group A, where was appointed Colonel General Harp. 
I knew Model well from 1941, when he commanded the 3rd Panzer Division. Describing the Russian campaign of 1941, I characterized him quite fully as a brave, tireless soldier, well aware of the situation at the front, able to apply his abilities in battle, and therefore enjoyed the trust of his soldiers. He soon became no good to lazy and incapable subordinates because he resolutely achieved his own. Model was the most suitable general for the exorbitant task of rebuilding the central part of the Eastern Front. Harp was an old tank officer originally from Westphalia calm, confident, brave and determined. Being a man of sober mind and cold judgment, he was also the right officer for the tasks that lay before him. Only thanks to the presence of mind and outstanding military ability of these generals was restored to the Eastern Front. It took some time, however, especially since an unforeseen event occurred which threatened to make all efforts to defend the homeland fruitless.